Brendan Cahill. My name is Brendan Cahill. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of International Humanitarian Affairs at Fordham University. Welcome to our weekly humanitarian webinar series. Uh, I want to thank all of you who have returned uh, week in, week out uh, to the series and to all of you who may be new to this. Um, uh, I want to go over uh, what we'll uh, uh, do today in terms of admin. Uh, but before then, just to tell you a little bit about the Institute. Uh, the Institute of International Humanitarian Affairs is an independent center that reports directly to the president of Fordham University. And we act as a link between the humanitarian and academic communities. We do that uh, mostly through training, through undergraduate and graduate programs and training programs, as well as through our publications and our research areas. The research areas being uh, the uh, Design for Humanity, which we've uh, been very fortunate to uh, collaborate with IOM with, with Education and Emergencies, uh, uh, where we've been working with Jesuit Refugee Service and Children in Armed Conflict. Um, uh, today's webinar uh, is What is a Migration Crisis? And it will follow the same structure as the past, uh, um, as the past webinars that we've had, which is that these introductory remarks will take up about five or so minutes. Um, our speaker will speak until about 10.30, and then we'll uh, look at questions and wrap up. Uh, so what is a migration crisis? Um, uh, I'm thrilled to invite Brian Kelly uh, to speak today. Uh, Brian Kelly is the head of the Community Stabilization Unit based in Washington, D.C. for IOM, the UN Migration Agency. Uh, prior to this position, Mr. Kelly was the Regional Emergency and Post-Crisis Advisor at the IOM Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. He has worked for IOM since 2000, the year 2000, and has worked uh, primarily in the Balkans, Afghanistan, Indonesia, Nepal, Iraq, Pakistan, and elsewhere. Specializing in humanitarian operations, community stabilization, peace building, reintegration, and the coordination of relief and recovery programming. He helps governments, the United Nations, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector support vulnerable populations and stabilize communities. Today, Brian will look at the unique characteristics associated with people on the move, emphasizing protection concerns. The migration corridors linking West Africa to North uh, Africa and Europe will be explored uh, in greater detail. The stories of some migrants who have undertaken the journey will be shared and the humanitarian and policy implications will be discussed. Um, as we all know, IOM was established in 1951 and is the leading intergovernmental organization in the field of migration, working closely with governments, intergovernmental uh, and non-governmental partners. So uh, with that, I would turn it over to uh, my dear friend, Brian, uh, on what is a migration crisis. Brian Kelly. Great. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction, Brendan. Thanks, thanks to yourself. Thank, thanks, Camille, uh, for, for, for Fordham and the Institute for International Humanitarian Affairs. It's, it's great to be able to discuss this issue. It's, it's certainly one that, that takes, uh, I think everyone's everyone's hearts when we see the the sad images throughout throughout the world, uh, and and we see it in the news every day because it's a hugely emotive issue, the issue of of migration. And so, what what is a migration crisis? It, there's no normative definition, uh, but we do know that it's something that that really touches people at their core and touches nations. At their core. I mean, just look in uh, in the U.S. Uh, post Civil War and the movement of the Northern Carpetbaggers heading into the South. Look look more recently in the in the news tied to the election about movements from blue states to red states and what what all of this means. The movement of people 
grabs the attention of, of policymakers and it grabs the attention of, of citizens. And when you add the, the, the additional dynamic of crossing the international border, uh, when you start talking about, again, for the U.S., the issue of, of caravans uh, moving, moving up towards the, the southern border, it, it's not simply a policy issue. Uh, it's, it's also a political issue, and it's a very emotional issue. And, and so, so that can create a, uh, a crisis. When you look at, at different figures, it was a, a couple years back, we may all remember in, in the news, huge issues of unaccompanied minors that are coming up to the southern border of, of the US. Uh, about two years ago, that, that number was roughly 75,000. A big number uh, and, 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 a, and a number of people who, who definitely need assistance, particularly because they're children. But if all the 75,000 were put in the Rose Bowl, one out of every four seats would still be empty. So, you know, we have to frame uh, what, the, what, what the issue is, but remember that we're dealing with a hugely emotive issue. At the core of sovereignty is the idea of managing one's borders. And so it's, it's, it's very understandable uh, when, when nations are taking various actions and and we have this balance of looking at something from a national security lens, but you can also look at something from, from a human security lens. But what are some of the common characteristics of, of a migration crisis? The crisis can occur while people are in transit. It can occur when they're at their destination. It could be sudden, say post natural disaster, right after an earthquake, right after a tsunami. Uh, it could be slow in onset, tied to climate change and fields no longer being as arable as they, as they are. It could be natural, can be man-made, and it, it can take place internally, and it can take place uh, as, as, we're crossing, as we're crossing a border. The common denominator is, is the fact that, that people are deeply affected by this, and that's, that's really where... I want to begin and really ground this in the fact that we're talking about people, we're talking about individuals that are making very difficult choices to move forward in, in their lives. This photo here is a photo of sub-Saharan Africans who had been transiting through Libya, trying to get largely to Europe. They've been imprisoned in both formal and informal prisons. There are a total of eight official det detention centers in Libya, but there are countless more unofficial detention centers. And I think in, uh, right now there's about 2,400 migrants that are in eight official detention centers in, in Libya. And in they're facing horrific circumstances. Uh, but they're not going in blind. There's an awareness of, of the challenges that, 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 that they're facing. So what is the driver? What are some of the situations that would still move someone to proceed and make these very, very challenging and, and difficult decisions? And that's, that's so tough when we try to place ourselves in the context of, of others. And we try to understand what drives them and what their, what their situations are. Being a migrant also can change the uh, criteria almost for, for vulnerability. If you close your eyes, and, and those of you have been in different various humanitarian crises, and we establish a protection cluster, uh, we start looking at the elderly, single-headed households, uh, unaccompanied women, lactating mothers. We do have our collectively agreed upon list 
of vulnerability criteria. But in post Qaddafi Libya, where, where this photo was taken, it was 18 to 25 year old unaccompanied sub Saharan African males who were incredibly vulnerable after the overthrow of Qaddafi. Now, why was that? They were deemed possibly to be a threat and possibly to be party to the conflict. Qaddafi had policies that encouraged Pan-African migration and post-Qaddafi, all of a sudden they were the symbol of that. And it created an enormous amount of danger for 18 to 25 year old unaccompanied men which normally, again, as we close our eyes and think of vulnerability criteria, they might not automatically hit the top of the list. But in this circumstance, because of their migratory status, they, they did. So as these movements occur, different countries are, are reacting to it. And the slide that I, that I put up it, it represents an approach that Europe has been taking in partnership with quite a few different organizations, including IOM, as to how they're looking at dealing with some of the migration patterns coming from West Africa. And what you see is you see the blue line, which actually is the physical border of Europe. And if you move down to the south of Morocco, Algeria, and Libya, what you see is a projected border. It's not a physical border, it's not a European border, but it's establishing various tools and border management support in order to help project uh, the, the the extension of a border. If we, we, everyone in, in the US has dealt with this. If you ever transited through a variety of different countries and you're at the airport in Dubai and, on, and you're talking to a DHS agent. <laughs> I mean, this is projecting further south uh, and further, for, further abroad is, is a common characteristic that, that, are, that, that, that is created. And it's being created uh, in response to, to, to the flows that are, that are occurring. And if you go to the bottom uh, in, in the greenish yellow, Niger, Mali, you'll see that largely the Sahel, there's another approach where there's a lot of capacity building and institutional strengthening and, and livelihoods development that's, that's occurring in order to reduce the the number of of migrants that are that are that, that are heading further north so it's a complex approach that different countries or regions take in response to uh, to what they see as a as a migration crisis and we're we're looking at you know fairly significant sums of money as as you'd see on the other half of uh of the slide. Just giving everyone a last second to take a look at that. But now I'm gonna shift and sort of take us around the world uh, before returning to, to West Africa. And, and if we move from, from West Africa and we move over to East Africa, if you look at the largest arrow there, you'll see flows from Ethiopia transiting through Yemen in order to get into Saudi Arabia. Now imagine that scenario. If everything works out for the best and you're a migrant on the move, and I think it's roughly for that larger arrow 74, 75% Ethiopians, about 24, 25% Somalis that are taking that path trying to get to kingdom of, of Saudi Arabia. If it all works out, 
you're going to transit through a country in the midst of a protracted war, Yemen, in order to become an irregular migrant without status in Saudi Arabia. That's if everything works out. That's best case scenario. Imagine the drivers, imagine the choices these individuals have to make where they're analyzing their circumstances. They understand them so much better than us. And they come to the conscious decision at the end that they're going to make that trek. Imagine making that decision. You know, but by going from West Africa, a bit on North Africa and over to East Africa, kind of skipped over Europe a little bit. And for Europe, for those of you who've been, been looking at the news in the last few days, there's the forcible camp closure of Bira in, in Bosnia. There's the Maria campfire in, in Greece. I think there's 10,000 migrants and refugees in Bosnia, 13,000 uh, on the island of Lesbos in, in Greece. They're in transit. They're trying to get to, to other parts of, uh, of Europe and they're facing they're facing horrific, uh, horrific circumstances. So now I'm not going to uh, have, a, have, a, have a slide for each of these next scenarios, but I just want to touch on, let's, 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 move, let's move east from East Africa a little bit. Uh, you, can look, you can look at the Middle East and look at the Syrian and Iraqi flows, uh, the refugee flows into, uh, into Europe. Move move a bit further east to, to Central America and South Asia. Iranians, Afghans, Pakistanis, all seeking better lives. They may also be heading to Europe. You start to get this, this term about mixed flows. Uh, are they refugees? Are they labor migrants? Are they economic migrants? In this term of mixed flows, population movements, including refugees, asylum seekers, unaccompanied minors, uh, victims of trafficking, uh, participants in smuggling networks, this, this, this broad mosaic of different groups of people are, are, moving, are moving out of a large swath of, of the world. And an interesting point is if you do look at this, at this slide uh, about, about East Africa, you'll see that 45% are transiting through Yemen and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but 50% are still moving within the Horn of Africa. And that's not simply an East Africa issue, that's, that's a global issue. Again, when we close our eyes and we think about migration, we have a tendency to think of a flow from what's called the Global South into the Global North. But regional migration is, is increasing. And movement within regions rather than crossing regions uh, tipped over the 50% a, a couple of years ago. And, and so it, it's interesting that the statistic here for East Africa uh, reflects some of the, 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 the broader global trends that we're, that we're dealing with. But we left in South Asia. So, so let's just think of a different perspective, a different lens on on a crisis, think of Nepal with COVID, and I haven't, I'm not gonna focus on COVID uh, so much in, in this conversation because it just, it, it's, it's such an enormous issue and it's having such a, a huge impact that, that, it would, that, that it would consume all of the time. But 31% of Nepal's GDP is through remittances. And the crisis with those overseas labor might that they're facing when their livelihoods are are cut off. Sometimes the xenophobia that they're that they're dealing with, even from their own communities when they return and labeled as as migrants, is a uh, is a huge issue. the The impact of uh, of, of remittance flows is is one that uh, that countries will be dealing with for for years. But let's move beyond. South Asia and we'll go over to Southeast Asia. We'll, we'll land in Myanmar for, for a moment. Huge flows of, of Rohingya refugees into, uh, into Bangladesh. 
annual movements uh, on, on various boat corridors, uh, leaving, leaving Myanmar, leaving Bangladesh, transiting through Malaysia. You start to see the shift in Southeast Asia where for parts of the world we've talked about, there's been a pull factor towards Europe. And now you've seen a bit more of a pull factor towards Australia as we, as we head further east. But again, remember, this regional migration and displacement is, is becoming more and more significant than, than the trend of going global south to, uh, to north. Further east, we can go to the Philippines with multi-generational displacement in, in the south, semi-annual large-scale natural disasters that are, are significantly impacting the, the movement of people on, on rural to urban migration for, for sure. Uh, as, we, as we cross the Atlantic, we'd look at the Pacific Island states and see the growing issue of climate affected displacement, uh, the growing issue of, of rising sea levels and salination of soil and, and salination of uh, uh, drinking water as we, as we look at those Pacific Island states and make it make it to uh, the content of the, of the Americas. So we'll, we'll look at the Americas and, and what, what's, the, what's the huge thing to look at? One is flows from Venezuela. Over 5 million refugees and migrants from Venezuela. Of that, about 800,000 have asked for asylum, 112,000 granted refugee status. And again, we have this issue of, of mixed flows. Uh, which is why the UN Secretary General asked IOM and our sister agency, the, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, to jointly manage a coordination platform about flows of Venezuelans outside of, of Venezuela. Uh, a positive note is that perhaps up to half of Venezuelans that are in, are in neighboring countries, they have access to some kind of visa. Uh, there's, there's a long history, particularly to say, where Colombia and Colombians had, had benefited from the largesse and support of, of Venezuela in decades past during displacement. And so there's a reciprocity going on and really some progressive policies that are, that are occurring in, in South America in, in regards to visas and, and accommodation. I've spoken largely about people in transit, migrants in transit, refugees in transit that are facing various horrific circumstances. But there's also the issue of migrants that are in, arrived in a country that's dealing with a crisis. Uh, you know, one example is as we move throughout the Americas in uh, the Western United States where we had all the different wildfires and we deal with migrants primarily working in the agricultural sector that are dealing with a lot of respiratory issues and, and other issues, but maybe because of their status, they're not able to access some of the same protective measures as, as others. But they're certainly dealing with the consequences of, of a crisis. It's having a huge impact on, on migrant health and, and livelihoods. And this now I'll jump, uh, now, I've, now I've moved back to, to a slide. Uh, the photo that, that was about my, uh, uh, for, for, this, for this event was, was a photo of me in, in the Bahamas about a year and a week ago. And, and this is a photo that I took uh, when, when we were there, actually I had a, a colleague took this photo. And we're standing, this photo right here is, standing in a place called the mud and the mud is a location in abaco island that had a large population of uh ethnic haitians and uh some had regular status in the bahamas some did not have regular status and the place was just simply decimated what you what you noticed was when you look carefully at this photo, 
you can see a green building further back. Hip gable roof, reinforced structure, and it's okay. Behind that, you'll see this white building, and that's the government building, and that's okay. So within the concept of preparedness and resilience building, what impact did the access to land tenure, did the access to formal banking networks, did the access to credit result in the structures that were built in some of the migrant communities being devastated while some other structures were not. It's an interesting issue about, about preparedness. And now we've gone full circle and we're back in, we're back in West Africa. And I just wanted to show you guys this uh this map that shows the complex flows if you look in the the lower left hand corner of of the map and you look you see ghana and cote d'ivoire and you see senegal and the transit that's going to the east through agadez in niger and then up through libya the migrants that I, I was in Agadez a couple of years ago and I was able to sit and talk with some of the different migrants, 19 year old, 21 year olds, uh, who, had, who had tried to, to transit through Libya uh, or were seeking work in Algeria and Libya. And, and just the horrific level of abuse that they had faced within the various internal borders, plus international borders, through having to pay fees, being arrested, if we go to that, think about that first photo that I showed about, about the group of, of young men that were in jail. How do they get out of jail? Well, they pay a ransom. How do they get out of the detention center? They pay a ransom. And where does that ransom come from? back at the place of origin through the extended family network. So just imagine each of those dots, every single bit of that transit is just an accumulation of more and more debt. When you get pulled over and you're asked for the $10, you're asked for the $20, you're then, you're then thrown into a detainment center. You then have to raise money through your extended family network. And as the debt level increases, the willingness to assume risk increases because you don't want to return home without having generated that, that income. Now, I really wanted to tell these stories and we can talk a bit more during, uh, during the conversation about some of the tools that, that we use in order to address this with the, the, the Global Compact on, on Migration, the Migration Crisis Operational Framework, uh, as well as the Migrants and Countries in Crisis initiative and we have discussed these during uh d during some of the question and answer and and otherwise but i think i'll just leave it at that brendan uh and and just want to thank everyone for taking the opportunity with me to talk a bit about west africa and going throughout the world to uh to deal with this 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 complex issue of mixed flows and and migration crisis many many thanks brian um for everyone who's on this webinar right now, the way we handle uh, questions is you just send them into either Camille, uh, into the host, or to me. Um, and what we'll do is we'll bundle them together. Uh, Brian, uh, I'm happy that we're uh, still on this slide. I had a question really about, it, it looks like um, so much of the flow comes through Libya and through Turkey. Um, uh, and, and those two countries have, have used migrants to their own political gain. Um, uh, could you talk a little bit more about, you know, sort of stemming that flow or what IOM is, is doing in response to that? You know, turning this spigot on and off. Sure. Um, 
you know, we're, we we have multiple approaches, uh, but by far the most important is ensuring that we're saving lives and alleviating su alleviating suffering uh, where 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 we can. I, I could speak a little bit about about Libya and and the flows that would be going up from Agadez and and heading heading through heading through Libya and and crossing over into into Europe or or, or seeking employment in Libya and and Algeria. Uh, you know the one of the, the the first things that we're that we're looking at is is how do we get assistance to the people and how do we gain access and this is not something that I, IOM deals with uh, bilaterally but but we do it with, with with through the broader the broader UN and and also the the, the various governments that that are focused on on this issue uh, access in the detention centers assistance in the detention centers and and then and then subsequently returns out of the detention centers and this was this was a very uh, uh, important issue for for IOM because if we had an opportunity to provide a return for migrants that were in detention centers and wanted to to go home then then we we were going to do that and and we were going to get them out of some of the horrific circumstances that that they had found themselves in it, when i was doing the interviews in in Agadez, i had i was told a story by a 19 year old from the cote d'ivoire and and he was telling me about his multi-year experience being in the detention centers in in libya and one of the best days of his life is that when when he had been sold from one detention center commander to another detention center commander who was was uh was from sub-saharan africa and he felt that that because he had moved into this new detention center uh that that his life might be more valued and you know that's really the horrific baseline that that were being that these people were being faced with, and on a policy level, IOM supports assisted voluntary return in many parts of the world. But if someone's in a detention center, is a decision they make really voluntary? And so, if they don't pass that litmus test of voluntariness, does that mean the resources shouldn't be provided to them? And so we had to talk with with different member states uh, and and really work on uh, on our policy for the the assisted voluntary the humanitarian returns that that we did to to that day and and so so it's a really long process and it's a really complicated process but we try to focus on where we can have an impact and. And move it, uh, move it forward with a, with a, with a primary focus on on life saving. The other the other part that I just touch on is about increasing the humanitarian border management capacity that that the different nations have, uh, and and so we work with different different nations about humanitarian border management, and and one tool that. If I'll, I'll I'll stick on this slide, but I'll just I'll just slide over so everyone can can see this. If you uh, if if you want to go on it later, there's there's a tool called the Migration Crisis Operational Framework. The the MCOF is is a link on on this slide, and I'm sure everyone will end up getting that slide. But I'll jump back here. If if you click on that, you'll see these 15 different sectors of assistance. Uh, whether or not it's humanitarian assistance or border management or visa processing, where where we try to work in preparedness, response, and recovery, uh, and in certain certain countries, Turkey, 
uh, a variety of others, uh, utilize some of those different, uh, those different parts of the, the, our toolkit to, uh, to do the work that they're doing. I, I hope that, that that answers your question, Brandon. Yeah, and, and I wanna get to a, a number of their beginning to flow in. Um, I, I have one, you had mentioned earlier about uh, COVID and the questions come in. Uh, in regards to the Venezuelan migrants, um, many have been forced to return to Venezuela because of COVID. Can you speak about what kind of assistance or protection, if any, is available to them once they are back in Venezuela? Um, and obviously COVID has affected other migrants as well. So what kind of assistance or protection is available to those Venezuelan migrants um, who have been forced back because of COVID? Well, the, the, the ultimate responsibility for getting assistance to, to, to people is the, is the country that, that governs that particular space. And, and the government of Venezuela uh, has, has some systems in place in order to provide access to healthcare, nutrition, and, and others. Uh, we have we have some programming in in, in the government or, or inside of, of Venezuela and and work closely with uh, with the government and civil society partners as as we as we deal with with getting assistance to to people. Uh, you know, there's also significant levels of assistance that are being delivered through the different uh, the different border countries. And I don't have that I don't have that slide. To, to, to be able to show, but there are certain things that can be done, such as allowing for a multi-entry visa, as opposed to a single entry visa. Because people at the end of the day, we do need to realize that they do want to return home. And people want to be largely at their, at their place of origin. And, and some of the different, uh, policies that, that the neighboring countries have set up are also allowing Venezuelans to cross a border, access health, access medicine, and then, and then return to their, to their place of origin. So it's, it's, not, it's not simply uh, just all service and delivery coming from one particular area, but, but migrants and refugees are figuring out what works best for them. Thanks, Brian. Um, so I, I, I'm just going to combine a few questions uh, here that you might uh, answer. One being, uh, how is the, the data of migration patterns collected? What are the tools to differentiate economic migrants with other migrants like uh, asylum seekers? Um, and there was another that... Uh, we could stop there and then, oh, the last is, what actions are being executed by IOM to prevent migration into high-risk sectors like human trafficking, right? So uh, really, if we can get to that sort of bottom baseline. So how do you prevent migration into human trafficking? How do you distinguish between a migration crisis and an emergency? What are the tools to differentiate the economic migrants with other migrants like asylum seekers? And how is that data collected? So it's a big whopper of a question, Brian. And I will, just uh, thought you could, you could play with all that. You know, allow me, uh, allow me to, to, to work backwards on this and, and starting with, uh, with trafficking. Uh, and first and foremost is assisting victims. And an IOM with its, with its global footprint has, has been able to provide direct assistance uh, to, to, to more victims of trafficking than I believe any other organization, but we certainly do it in partnership with, with many. Uh, what is the immediate uh, needs that that people have uh, either dealing with psychosocial issues, dealing with abilities to get uh, 
unified back with uh, with extended family members or or with family at at their place of origin, getting that that reintegration to to occur, and it's such a complicated issue because if you're a victim of trafficking, it's quite likely that you knew your trafficker and the trafficker might be part of your extended family network. So what is the direct assistance to victims? Then you start moving towards a, a policy level and it's, it's normal for us to receive requests from different member states from country to provide an analysis of counter trafficking legislation in different countries in their region. And that would be helpful for them to craft or revise their own counter trafficking legislation. And then once a country has legislation in place, then there is the issue of trainings that, that need to occur. Trainings for the police and trainings for the judiciary so that victims of trafficking don't get treated as criminals, but get treated as, as victims. And, and so you have your direct assistance, you have your, uh, uh, in, in essence, your, 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 your regulatory analysis to inform uh, legislation on the country level, and then you have, you have training on, 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 the different, uh, on the different legislation and, and the protocols that, that exist on a, uh, on a country level. Um, you know, how do we deal with the different categories I think the first, the first thing that, that, that has been absorbed and recognized is that, is that it's, it's, it's largely not just any one single flow or group of people that are moving from A to B. And, and I think the, uh, a significant, there's, there's a couple different recognitions of it. I, 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 I talked about Libya before, so I will one more time. Uh, and, and that was after the, the, the overthrow of, of Gaddafi, uh, there was a huge migrants crisis. We had talked about those vulnerable migrants and how are we going to deal with them? There were also Libyans that were feeling incredibly unsafe and feeling persecuted and were crossing international borders. So you had migrants fleeing, you had Libyans fleeing, uh, refugees fleeing, and and so it was really IOM and UNHCR that created a joint cell uh, in order to handle the movement of people, in order to handle the unique characteristics and vulnerabilities and requirements of these, of these people that were crossing the border, these mixed flows, if you will. And, and so it was really working, working in partnership. And I think, I think that has had a certain impact on the approach taken with, with Venezuela, which has resulted in, and again, the Secretary General saying, you know, UNHCR and IOM jointly manage this platform for coordination of, of assistance and make sure that we're getting assistance to the vulnerable people who are, who are on the move. The, the processing of an asylum claim and the granting of, of refugee status is, is a complicated status or complicated process which does, which does, take, which does take time. But meanwhile, uh, assistance needs to be provided. And, and I think that, that that's, that's manifesting itself through this like interagency approach that, that we're taking, making sure that assistance is getting out to the, the right people and, and then working through the individual status issues uh, as they as they come up. So next is going to be uh, perhaps a good news uh, question. Um, the question comes in: IOM implements huge stabilization programs throughout the world um, in Africa, Asia, etc. Uh, what has IOM learned by managing these migration crises? Do they have any specific success stories to tell? Um, that related that, that you would like to you know sort of relate here, right? So, as you know, Brian, within the humanitarian sector, where we very often learn by by failures, but 
but that, that arc of justice moves in the right direction. Um, with all this new data, with all of the work that you've done, um, you know, point to what the, the good news is, if there is good news that you can go to. Well, you know, one for, for humanitarian assistance, because uh, we're talking about people, when, let me let, let me let me look, explain it a different way. Uh, you can only do three things as as a human. We've got our physical body, right? You can stay where you are. You can, if you're not where you if you're not where you're from, you can go back to where you're from, or you can go somewhere else, right? It, it, that, those are the only three options: stay where you are, go back, go back home, or or, or go go somewhere else, and and for people to, to be at home, they need to have access to livelihoods. They need to have access to rule of law. They need to feel that their family is going to prosper. They need to have, they need to have opportunity. I just can't still wrap my head fully around, I just have so much respect for the horrible decision-making process that an individual would have to make and say, I'm gonna leave my family and I'm gonna transit through Yemen in order to be an irregular migrant. And understanding that and still deciding to make that, to make that decision. And so, so how do you increase uh, the different the different abilities for, for people to, to be at home. You know, one thing that we can do is with humanitarian assistance, we, we provide lots of goods and commodities and the larger agencies provide them in line with international specifications. But quite often our procurement and our supply chain are coming from procurements in just a few different countries with the manufacturing base being sent to countries that don't have those same supply chains and they just ends up being recipients of humanitarian largesse. So how can we create supply chains that are domestic and therefore increase the, uh, the, the number of jobs and opportunities that are available for, for people? So that's something that we're certainly, we're certainly digging into. Uh, one thing that we're looking at as well is we're looking at exactly what are the different drivers for, for migration and what's, what's a short, long, or short, medium, and longer term plan to, to deal with some of the issues of irregular migration and the consequences. One is if you, if you start a program in a country that's largely a labor sending country uh, and you're looking at different livelihoods opportunities, Increased access to capital in the short term is more likely to increase migration than it is to, to decrease it because people will have some of the, the, the available income which, which is required to make the decision. And so when we talk with different member states and we do our planning, we know that we need to commit to a long term. And this isn't something that simply IOM does. We're talking about uh, uh, longer term programming with the World Bank, direct assistance, bilateral assistance between, between countries. And but making sure that, that the assistance and the development of those countries is part of a long term plan. Because if you, if you frame it within the shorter term, and then on year two, you have, you have uh, increased, increased movements of people into insecure environments, uh, that may be an indication that things are starting to create capital for people, but you haven't hit that hit that level where where people are taking root back back at their back at their place of origin. And so there, there's a variety of of different things, and, and a lot of the different tools that that we have to to deal with them are on on this last slide that that I have up. Uh, and I, I think one 
where we've had a fair modicum of, of success is the Migrants and Countries in Crisis initiative, where, where we're looking at countries that are facing an issue and, and are seeking assistance and best practices about how to make sure that assistance is going to migrants. You can even think of Japan after, after Fukushima and a lot of the assistance that was being directed, the migrants weren't understanding because it was all in Japanese. And so what kind of assistance and programming has to be multilingual? That's something that's been adopted and is, is being done in, in California right, right now. So, so there, there are examples of where we're getting a better understanding of the unique characteristics of migrants and tailoring programming, which, uh, which, will, which will affect them so they don't just, they don't just get uncounted or, or don't get assistance. Brian, I want to I want to get to uh, as many questions as we can, um, but there are two uh, two here. I'll give you one at a time. Actually, um, to what extent has externalization of borders and deliberate barriers to those seeking to exercise their right to seek asylum and other forms of international protection? How has that created or exacerbated the sense of crisis? Right? How have this? And you show that in the slide. Of, uh, uh, of the continent of Africa, of, you know, the sort of support, you know, away from Algeria in the Sahel, you know, early on. Yeah, there, exactly. So uh, how has this externalization of borders created and or exacerbated the sense of crisis? Well, it's, it's, done, it's done a couple of things for, for sure. Uh, from, from the perspective of, of the migrant, what I wanted to say was, was that it is, let me just move back here, it is broader, uh, I, I use the European example, but uh, you have similar issues in the U.S. in projection into into Central America or Australia projection into uh, Indonesia, and and it certainly uh, you know it certainly is is challenging, and, and I think that countries right now are are working through how, how they're best going to deal with, with receiving asylum claims. I know that, that the U.S. earlier had, had led a process talking to other countries that perhaps were not traditionally uh, receivers of, of refugees and trying to identify what kind of tools or assistance or support they would need in order to accept more refugees. Uh, the, I think the issue of refugee resettlement occurring in more countries throughout, throughout the world is, is one that, that's definitely going to continue. Uh, because it can become, it's, it's not that it can be, it does become not simply looked at through a, a humanitarian lens, but it, but it very quickly becomes political. Um, let, let's end with this one. Um, despite progress in Somalia over the past decades, the situation on the ground still does not allow for mass voluntary repatriation and the return of refugees especially those in the Dadaab camp in Kenya. What sustainable solutions do you think are being implemented by the United Nations for the tens of thousands, actually I would say hundreds of thousands um, of Somalis who have been refugees for almost their entire life? So one example. I think that what we've seen is a lot of different countries have reached out 
to the government of Kenya that has supported the the Somali refugees in its in, in, in its border to 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 this date and for, for for quite a long time to figure out what is going to be the the solution for for these people when as you very aptly mentioned we have all of the the the, the multi generational uh, issues that are going on in in Somalia uh, I always want to be a an optimist not not a pessimist but but as as countries progress and move move towards more stability those are those are long term goals and meanwhile these these individuals are, are are getting older and we want to make sure that that people have access to the healthcare access to education access to to livelihoods i think that something that has been absorbed by by the un uh, and broader than that by by the humanitarian community and more and more governments is that you know camps are easy to open they're really difficult to close and when we look at as opposed to a shelter solution we look at, at just a, a technical solution we have to look more broadly at at shelter and settlement you know we have to look at these camps being places that require longer term infrastructure uh, and, 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 and building it correctly in, in an initial approach. And see, that, that makes sense because as time goes on, we recognize that the people are still there, but that's looking at it with a humanitarian lens. When you're looking at it from purely a, a political landscape, then, then there are political consequences to, to governments being communicating that to, uh, to their population. And, and we've, seen, we've seen the discourse on, on this issue throughout, throughout the world. So, so I think that similar to in where Afghans have been accommodated in, in, in Pakistan, have been accommodated in Iran, uh, where Somalis have been accommodated in in Kenya, the you know other countries have to work with those those governments to to help figure out what that solution is for that for that particular population. But we also have to uh, respect the fact that that these countries have accommodated. They did say yes to to significant numbers of people when they were really really vulnerable. And, and that is not something that, that we can universally say across the world is, is occurring. Brian, do you have any uh, sort of last comments? Because I, I like to keep this to time, but uh, you know, from the presentation, from the questions, any last comments there? I appreciate that, that this is a complex issue and I appreciate the the willingness of people to discuss it and and engage it. There are few more emotive issues than sovereignty. And it is a very complex issue. It's a humanitarian issue. It's a political issue. It's an economic issue. Uh, and and I want to thank you for for the opportunity. Brandon,